Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Neil. We appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning to those online. Good morning. Um, before we start, I'll just say the shit is given um, the Nishmas, my grandfather, Rameya ben Rib Shimon, who's uh, who's outside is today. Um, so we're looking at the relationship between Pshat and uh, Medrash, uh, Pshat and Droshus of Chazal, uh, times when Chazal seem to take Psukim away from Pshat and Shilmikra, and what the relationship is between Pshat and Medrash. Um, we saw a an approach that, in essence, Medrash is simply Umek Kapshat, the depth of Pshat. So when one learns Medrash, one's really learning the, the most uh, um, authentic or, or accurate exposition of the uh, of the Pshat and the Psukim. And uh, without Medrash, one isn't really understanding the, the depth of Pshat. And it's true that Medrash often ends up reading Psukim, Psukim differently to uh, how we would naturally read a text. It seems a very non-simple reading of the text. Uh, nonetheless, this is a mistake. If we understand the way the Torah works as a as a text, as a book, um, we would realize that this is the this is the pshat of the pasuk. Um, in the same way as when you read poetry and you understand a line to be a metaphor, that's not moving away from pshat. It's not it's not the pshat that uh, it's not it's not that the uh, um, you know uh, the the Totemira gives an example. He says if you say um, a drop of ink drowns a city. You don't mean that the drop of ink literally drowns all the people in the city. You mean a, uh, a declaration of war signed by a drop of ink is what caused to, uh, the destruction of the city. So that, that's not a move away from Peshat. That, that is Peshat. The, the language of metaphor is that when you say the drop of ink drowned the city, you don't mean that uh, literally. You mean that as a, as a way of communicating a certain concept. And Torah is that sort of book that needs to be understood medrashically. Medrash is the Omek of Peshat. That's one way of understanding it. Um, we saw an alternative approach that um, uh, we saw an alternative approach that indeed shut and medrash are different layers of meaning. Um, in which case, we need to understand how they how they work together, and and I mean, but which one is what the pasuk really meant, and how does one understand the two layers of meaning, both in the halachic realm and in the realm of stories? And we saw uh, different examples of this. And we we saw indeed Rishonim, uh, the Rashbam, the Ibn Ezra, but many others too, even even. Uh, Rishonim like uh, the Rambani, who are happy in a sense to argue with Chazal when it comes to Pshat. And they'll say that the Medrash says this, but we, we can re look at the Psukim and understand this on the Pshat level, and that's also a legitimate way of learning the Psukim. Um, when it comes to Halacha, we're no Karats, Chas Vashonim, we, we adhere to the authority of Medrash and the Drashat of Chazal, but Pshat Shalmikra also communicates a, a level of uh, Torah and is important in, in understanding what's being uh, what's being said. Yes. So even even when the Torah is quoting someone's speech, um, th there's a number of things to say. First of all, um, I don't know ever, but certainly in many cases, the Torah is not quoting word for word what has been said. Um, when communication is taking place, it may be communication in a foreign tongue. What language were Moshe and Paro negotiating in? Were they negotiating in Lashon HaKodesh? Probably not. When uh, the Egyptians didn't speak Lashon HaKodesh, they spoke Egyptian. When the brothers came down and Yosef was still pretending to be an Egyptian ruler, he had an interpreter. So presumably, uh, Moshe and Para are negotiating in Egyptians. So the Torah is translating what's being said. That's the first point. The second point is it's not necessarily an, an entirely word for word uh, transcription of what's said. Um, Moshe's final speech to Klalisol, Sefer Dvarim, takes a, a month or so. Um, however long Sefer Dvarim is, um, it's text of several hours of, of maximum of, of speech. So uh, the assumption is that um, that the, the words that, that are told to us, the people being said, uh, being said by people, is itself a part of Torah. The Torah is choosing to bring out of the conversation that which is pertinent or, or particularly uh, important and significant, and may choose to do so in a way that has uh, dual meaning or layers of meaning. Um, there's a very famous uh, 
um, Chazal, several famous Chazals, I'll pick one from uh, this week's Setra that we just learned, in which um, in Bilom, in his negotiation, in fact, I think it was in the Dvatoya sheet this week, also quoted a uh, uh, Gaon about this, um, Bilom, when negotiating with Hashem, whether he has the right to go and accompany uh, Bolot's agents to curse the Jewish people, um, Chazal, the Vilna Gaon plays with, the Pesuk more confusing because Hashem seems to say, you can go, you can't go, then he's upset that Binam goes, a little, little confusion. And Vilna Gaon picks up on, in Hebrew, subtlety of language of Hebrew, where there's a difference between, there's two ways in Hebrew saying, I'm going with you, I'm going itcha with you, or imcha with you. Vilna Gaon picks up that there's a nuance between when you go with someone where there's a complete identity of purpose, or you go with someone where there's differences between you. So, so these, are, these are nuances in language which uh, are being picked up there. That aren't necessarily in line with the actual words that Bilam spoke, but uh, are explaining his motives. In the story of Eliezer, Eved Avram, so Eliezer is sent uh, on a mission to, um, uh, to, to seek a spouse for Yitzchak, and Chazal pick up on his language of Ulai, maybe they won't go with me, and they say Eli, there's a subconscious motive at work in which he's, uh, in fact, this is a good example, of Medrash and Peshat working in sync. Um, the Chazal say that when Eliezer turns to Avram and says, what happens if my mission is not successful? What should I do? And Avram responds, do not take a lo local Canaanite girl, no matter what, uh, make sure that you won't. But if it's not successful, then, then we can see what happens. So Eliezer uses the language of Ulai goes over, perhaps she won't go with me. And Chazal pick up that the Ulai is chosevav, is missing above. Eli it's hinting. To me, in other words, Eliezer's is dreaming, maybe my mission won't be successful and my daughter will be the one that can marry uh, Yitzchak. So again, which language does Eliezer use? And even if you use that language, when you speak, there's no way of showing chaser or molay. Whether Eliezer's speech, when he said, maybe Yitzchak won't go with me, or lie, he didn't spell it with a vov or without a vov. So that the text is communicating nuances and meaning. On the other hand, maybe in Peshat, so this looks like a Midrashic reading, picking up on an absence of all, whether the Ulai, perhaps she won't go with me, is spelled without a vov, hinting at Eli, to me, I hope she doesn't go with me because then my daughter stands a chance. Um, it, 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 seemingly a sort of Midrashic reading of the Pasuk, but maybe also hinted up in Peshat, because in Hebrew there's two words for maybe. There's Ulai, maybe, and there's Pen, maybe. Now Pen, type of maybe, peinun, is often translated in English as lest. In other words, pen is a maybe that you fear, whereas ulai is a maybe that you're okay with. So the, the, the medrash may be picking up actually on a nuance of Peshat, in which Eliezer should have said pen, Lesega, lest she doesn't want to go with me. In other words, he should have indicated the possibility of me not succeeding and bringing a wife back to Yitzchak is a negative one. When he says ulai, perhaps you won't want to go with me. Maybe he's sort of hinting that there seems to be something a little positive or embracing about it. And, and the, the examples are countless in, in the Torah, in which um, even in speeches of people, how you quote a speech and, and you know, the tune you give to the words that are said, what the stress is on, which aspects of it you, you choose to quote, is very significant. Um, don't forget, in the stories of the Torah, that there's enormous um, editing going on. In, in, and this is, by the way, why we take seriously every word that's, that's said in the Torah. The, the others lived for long and fruitful lives. Um, the sum totality of what we know about Aram's life is that which is included in a couple of sedras. We know maybe 15 instances out of Aram's life. Yaakov, we know a little bit more. He has, he has four sedras. We may know 20 details of his life. Yitzchak only has three quarters of a sedra dedicated to him. So out of a, a long life, we, we only know four or five scenes out of their lives. So when the Torah tells us a scene, um, uh, you know, uh, an argument between Avram and Sorrow, between uh, Yaakov and uh, uh, Rivka, and, and, uh, and uh, Rachel, I'm sorry, it, there's a reason it's choosing, uh, choosing to tell us this story. It's clearly something significant that it wants us to know about the lives of the, uh, lives of the others. So the, the Torah's editing, the information it tells us is, is, is important. Um, we learn halachas from narratives in the Torah, because we assume what it tells us has, has, is, is teaching us something. Um, maybe one, uh, one, I was thinking about speaking about this on my Friday night, Zvahalacha, I try and choose a Zvahalacha that links somewhat to the Sedra. So maybe next year I'll speak about this. But the donkey turns to Bilom and has a moral claim on Bilom. What, why, do you, why are you hitting me? Now the Halachists look at that and say, ah, oh, you see that there is a moral claim on a human being, Jew or non-Jew, not to needlessly cause pain to its, to the, to, to its animal. 
So we are learning a halacha from a donkey. We're learning a halacha from a donkey's claim against Bidam. But the point is, if, if the donkey, if the Torah shares with us, and the donkey turns to Bidam and says, why are you hitting me? It's clear that uh, there's a complaint against Bidam. There's, there's something unjust happening here, from which we learn that cruel treatment of animals is, is, is halachically significant, is a moral imperative. And from that, we, we, we learn more detail about the concepts of Shavu Mitzvah in Iraq. Regular Tzabar Khan is not listed in the Shavu Mitzvah in Iraq. It means that it's not an exhaustive moral ca- ca- category of expected Ben Noach behavior. And, and so the examples are just, they're just infinite. So um, even when stories are told and quotes are made, including even quotes from donkeys, there's, there's, there's a midrashic exposition that's uh, that's legitimate in, in this, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Arguments from the. Fine. Still a quote though. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is an important question, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not taking a stance on this. Um. Where do Madrashim come from? Where does Pshat come from? It, are they part of the handed down oral tradition of the Torah, Halakha Moshim Sinai? And when we say Messinai, do we mean at Sinai or do we mean the 40 year event? Okay, so these are two separate questions. The first is a discussion as to how the Torah was given, what part of it was given on Har Sinai and what part of it was given over the 40 years. The second is a general question where does Torah Shvalpeh, the bulk of Torah Shvalpeh, come from? I'm not going to address that now. Um, I gave a series, and I'm happy to relook at it, on, on Torah Shabal Peh, um, and, and it, it, you have a, a maximalist position that most of what we find in Torah Shabal Peh is part of oral tradition, and a minimalist position that only things which are explicitly labelled as Halacha and Moshe Messinai are part of the oral tradition given at Sinai, maybe several hundred pieces of information, and everything else is Chazal reading the Pesukim and using the interpretive tools of, let's say, the third and middle Rabbi Shmuel. Correct, but I'm not taking start, a stance here as to where the Medrashim derived from. How, <laughs> excuse me, whether a Medrash is part of a, a handed down oral tradition, or whether a Medrash is part of a, um, a, a certain type of special reading of the text that Chazal will engage in, um, either way, we have Medrashim, and now we want to know, what, what are these Medrashim saying? Are they saying we are shut? Oh, you make up shots, the depth of shots, or we're in an entirely different layer of meaning between shots. That's our, that's our conversation. And, and there may well be a range of different things. So um, Chazal will tell us the story of, um, I mentioned this, I think, last week or two weeks ago, the, the story of uh, Avram being thrown into the fiery furnace is, is no explicit pasuk, really. Um, it's alluded to in, in, in some respects in one word, oral custom, the, the oral customs. What does oral custom mean? Does it mean oral, the fiery furnace of the custom? Or does it mean oral, the city called Ur in, uh, in, in, the, in the region of custom, which, which exists to this day and, and so on? So, um, so what's, the, what's the relationship between, uh, what, you know, what, what, where does this story come from? Rav Hirsch points out in a letter in which he discusses these things, um, he says certainly many of these stories may have been oral traditions that the Jewish people had. They may not even come from Sinai, they may predate Sinai. Don't forget, we're talking about the family of the others, and maybe uh, Claudius, well, when they left Egypt, they carried with them various traditions about stories that happened to their ancestors. So it's possible that some Adrashim predate Matan Torah also. They're, they're, they're part of the sort of uh, family tradition of the, uh, of the others that, uh, that they had. So uh, it, there's not necessarily one answer to the question, and, and either I'm not in the sense that's not my topic, where they come from. I'm simply commenting on, on the Adrashim. People refer Torah Balpeh means all of this. Torah Balpeh either means oral law in the sense of Balpeh as an orally transmitted, or Balpeh as learned in the base Medrash. That, that, the term Torah Balpeh doesn't take size in this. You open a page of Gemara, and Gemara can consist of an explicit halach of Moshe Messina, which is clearly an oral tradition. As I said, across the whole of Shas, there's only a few hundred of them. And then it can be a Machlokas Rav and Abaya, which is arguing in Sfarah. And reason very clearly in Sarah and reason, and both of those can be referred to as uh, as uh, or, or, sorry, 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 yeah. Okay, so that's the uh, um, that's again uh, just, just in a sense uh, reminds me where we're up to. Um, last week, I think the concluding thing we looked at was the famous pasuk of Ayin Tachas Ayin, which is a nice case study of this. Is the translation in Peshat an eye for an eye that indeed you should knock out the eye of the uh, of the criminal? 
it, as a punishment for knocking out the eye of the victim. That's Pshuto Shul Mikra. And it is a drasha of Chazal that says monetary compensation, and Halacha follows the drasha, in which case we have a two layered meaning of Pesukim. Or no, the Oymet Kapshat, if you read the Pasuk with care, you will understand that the translation of the phrase, eye in Tachatayn, really means an eye in place of an eye, i.e., pay monetary compensation. And the Nafkamina, in a sense, the difference will be when, when you're, is there a legitimate reason in the Pasuk? When you're learning, teaching the Pasuk in primary school, right? Is there a legitimate reason of the Pasuk to translate the Pasuk an eye for an eye and to translate it as, because that's Pshutish Mikra, that's a layer of meaning in the Pasuk? Or no, that's a wholly illegitimate reading because the Pasuk never said that. The Pasuk only ever meant the Midrashic reading, which is an eye in place of an eye, i.e., monetary compensation. And we saw a, a string of Rishonim that, that take the simple meaning, in a sense, as being an eye for an eye, yeah, Lex Talonis, as giving an eye for an eye. And they say the Torah is teaching an ideal, really uh, a criminal who knocks out the eye of a victim deserves to have their eye knocked out. Um, really, it's immoral almost to talk about monetary compensation for a human being. A human is not capital. If you damage an animal, you damage a, a pot and a pan and a chair. That's the laws of tort. So that's the laws of Nazikin, where you can pay money. But you damage a human, that's a criminal offense. That's a capital offense. How can it be that monetary compensation is appropriate? However, in practical law, we do monetary compensation, but the Torah is teaching a value that really what's what's gone on here. Um, the the Sfano says that that the, 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 the unless the person does to shiva, what it's saying is really that the, the correct thing is that they should suffer. But the monetary conversation is a kapora, is a way of cleaning up the mess they've made. So there's there's there's, there's ways of understanding this. We saw the Ramman Paskins that um perhaps connected with this idea that bakoshas mechila, that, that monetary compensation loan is not enough. You also have to ask mechila from the victim. You have to, you have to amend, amend the relationship that was there, as opposed to other cases where just monetary compensation is enough. So if I, if I accidentally um, drive into your car and, and uh, or, uh, you know, damage your, your table, monetary compensation is enough. I did monetary damage. I paid monetary compensation. If I do physical injury to someone, then monetary compensation is not enough. There has to be a bakash mechila, a bakash mechila, and, and, and so on and so forth. So we saw um, layers of, this was a good example of where layers of meaning, understanding that, a good example of two things, a good example of a debate as to whether the Medrashic reading, which says don't read it as an eye for an eye, but read it as compensation, is actually really the correct for shot also. That was one possibility. Or no, there's two levels of reading it. The Medrash, which says it's compensation, the Peshat, which says it's literally an eye for an eye, and both layers teach us something. In practical halacha, we follow the, the drashal, the Medrashic reading, but in moral uh, concept, it's teaching us something else through the Peshat shall make those, those are the this is a, an example of this um i'll, I'll give a, a second example of this just just to bring out this idea and actually i'd like to use today really just to finish off examples and next week i i, I hope to sort of head towards the end game of the share where i want to look at some of the the philosophical challenges around this we've moved actually quite a long way away away from philosophy in in, in exploring this but i do want to get back to philosophy um which is 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 to what degree the torah can be read as a philosophical text and uh, when we look at some of the stories in, in Beratius at the beginning of the Torah particularly, is there any grounds for legitimate modern interpretation, modern medrash, in which we uh, understand the Pesukim um, not to be telling us literal stories or, or history, but telling us conceptual ideas. Are, the, are these at all legitimate readings of the Pesukim? Are these tools in resolving some of the challenges of science and so on and so on? So I'd, I'd, I'd like to sort of draw us back to uh, this was meant to be the series, perhaps has been misnamed. Um, I think it's called Big Philosophical. What was it called? Big Philosophical. I mean, we've, we've, uh, for various reasons, we've ended up uh, effectively this ending up as a partial share of sorts, but I think it's important. Um, so so I, I, I want to try and this week finish off examples around this and the next week sort of move back to bigger questions about what sort of book is the Torah and how are we meant to uh, relate to it, which was really our goal. Modern so, Modern Medrash. Well, if, if, if the Rashbam and the Ibn Ezra and really the Ramban teach us that we can learn Pshutu Shal Mikra without having to align with Chazal, and uh, um, uh, the Rashbam uses this language of Hapshatim Shneschatim Cholion in our base of Medrash, there, there are there's Pshat which is innovated every day. Um, can we ask? Can we say? Can, can we generate non-literal readings of the Pesukim? Uh, based upon uh, our, our thought or not. Maybe, maybe that's trafe and, and a profoundly dangerous thing to do, or, or maybe not. Maybe maybe this is uh, legitimate. Um, and we'll, we'll see the Rishonim that discuss, uh, discuss this idea. Um, it's dangerous. There's no doubt this opens a can of worms. 
a hundred percent. And uh, um, I, I, I do ultimately, even though in a sense this, we, we've been looking at quite a lot of Pasha over the last couple of years, I, I do want you to understand that this this, this is this isn't a Pasha shit. These are these are profound these are profound topics as to what sort of work the Torah is, what is the Torah, and how are we meant to relate to it, and what is the interaction between human reading of a of a god-given text and and it ultimately gets down to on, on the deepest level what does it mean to be a finite being of of limited perception trying to read the words of an in, infinite god and and ideas that we throw around casually when we talk about elu the elu divinikim time these and these are the words of living god shivim ponim the torah rashi who who when he speaks the little bit that rashi gives us the glimmer rashi gives us of what multiple pshat means and he says, Kapatish Yifotsitsela, like a hammer smashing a rock, where, where the rock scatters into lots and lots of chips that go flying all over the place. In this imagery are, are very scary and, and very deep ideas around what it means to be a human being attempting to listen to the infinite God. And what what, what fragments of truth are we humans capable of, of perceiving? So these aren't uh, these aren't small ideas. And certainly when we look next week at Imit Hashem at uh, um, at some modern examples of this, when we look at safe erasures, we're dealing with with ikre hadat. These aren't uh, we're, we're dealing with fundamentals of faith. These aren't these aren't small uh, um, topics. So um, I'm, I'm half joking when I say and we, uh, there's a reason why I've tried. I'm trying to give lots of examples in 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 Shutter Shemitka because I'm not trying to give a, a, a sense of the wealth of discussion that is around this and. Um, Jews don't really do philosophy. In other words, we, we don't we, we don't classically have that many philosophy texts. It's all communicated for what we would nowadays call philosophical ideas through the tools of medrash, through the tools of stories and poetry and agoda and and parables. They didn't they didn't do Greek style systematic uh, philosophy. I, I think I've said this before. Like you know, like like in Shakespeare, you can learn if you kaviyachal, you can learn uh, philosophical truths, psychological truths. He wasn't a systematic psychologist. And and in 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 the um, in in Chazal, they're teaching us uh, profound ideas through the language of of medrash and metaphor and so on. Um, and and Chazal, one of the tools they did this was by seeing a difference between pshat and uh, and medrash. So let let me try and give another another example of this. So yes. Are there any no-go areas? Um, I, I don't think so, really. Meaning, it's, it's Torah you've a little bit on your I mean, like we're, we're meant to be learning Torah, and we, we have to be able to run explore. I, I, to, for me, I, I, the thing, on a personal level, I, I, that I think that, um, I think if one's modest, it's okay to ask questions and explore answers. I think if one begins proclaiming in strident voices with certainty around some of these questions. That's where one gets into dangerous uh, dangerous territory. And I also personally don't see a need to take sides in this. I, I don't see a, um, I speak a lot about the difference between the, the Rambam and his philosophical approach and the with their Kabbalistic approach. I, I find it laughable personally when someone says, um, you know, I'm a rationalist, I'm a Maimonidean, you know, so you've got on one side, you've got the Arizal, you've got the Vilna Garden, you've got the Baal yeah, yeah. Shem I, I don't know what it means to take sides in these sorts of debates and 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 be machria, a determined between them, particularly when religion in its essence is mystical. And, and there's no, when you say you're a rationalist as a Jew, you, you but we're, we're talking about profoundly mystical ideas of what it means to be a human relating to that which is beyond. I think it's just about for a person to say, a particular approach speaks to me. My, my, I, I can live in line with this. I can be inspired by this. I can draw energy from this. Um, this is what I want to learn. This is what I want to teach. I, I don't think that modesty and awareness that there are great figures on both sides and that what, what Zobin happens to relate to in the debate between a, a Rambam and a Vilna Gaon has, has zero significance. I, I don't think recognizing that means that everything is vague and fluffy and you can't you can't anchor yourself to any path in life. I, I think to try and be, um, I'll say this without the capital M, capital O, but modern orthodox in the sense of engaging with the modern world as an orthodox Jew, I don't think means that we have to be in denial or censor different approaches in Yiddishkeit. I don't think it has to mean that, you know, we, we um, in a debate between, in modern times, between uh, a Rebbe and a Shem Shabal Hash about what Judaism should look like, 
I don't think it means even there that we have to take sides. I think one can simply say, for me, this is what works and this is what allows me to connect to Hashem and grow as a person and as a, a Jew. So um, I, I don't think anything... Uh, um, I don't think we we, sh we should be unable to ask this question, but there are limits to what one can uh, what one can answer. Um, the Gemara also speaks about certain ideas, which it says are not appropriate to discuss in public. Well, it says most um, uh, 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 it shouldn't be discussed in public. Most cover. There are ideas that one has to be very careful how one discusses in public because again they can they can lend themselves to uh, to misunderstanding. But but the Gemara itself was was very it was extraordinarily open in what it discusses and what it. Uh, what, what it looks at, and uh, we, we should follow the, the, the we should follow Chazal, and uh, that they taught us to to explore and to ask questions. So, okay, um, so I'm posted to what's about the rest of Nach. Um, I, I guess that means what are the parameters of Pshat and the rest of Nach, and uh, so on. Um, at, at least when I was talking about the rest of Nach, uh, it, it, it's it, it's less. Um, concerning in terms of uh, of Ikri Hadas uh, in this area, but it's really the same discussion around around the whole of Tanakh. Okay, um, let me try and just give a couple of other examples of this before we run out of time. Um, one one example of this is is a, a Chazal that looks at the pasuk of Leolam of of Verotza Adonov es Osno b'Matzei of Avado Leolam. Right, the pasuk in Mishpatim very clearly says that an Evet Ivri who um, who chooses to stay with their master has their ear bored in some particular way, and then avodo Olam should serve for ever. Now Chazal ask a contradiction in the pesukim because the pasuk tells us that at the Yovel, this is in uh, Vayikra, twenty um, fifth chapter of Vayikra. The pasuk tells us that at the Yovel, cross and Durar, one should call freedom. Of Ishal Mishpach to each uh, a person should go back to their um, their family. And Kadasha uh, Mishnasach Mishim, cross and Durar Bar, etc. So Rashi on uh, on Mishpatim quotes Chazal, who say that Avodu Leolam means till the Yovel. Somehow till the Yovel means Leolam forever. So again, how how do we understand this? This is another example of Chazal um, seemingly taking Pesukim out of their Pshutay Shal Mikra. Um, and again, we, we could have both approaches. We could say this is Pshutay Shal Mikra, that somehow Le'olam doesn't... What does the word Le'olam actually mean? Or what's the etymology of the word Le'olam? What's the translation of the word Le'olam? Um, we, we use a word, Adon Olam, Shem Alach, right? Adon Olam. What's this Olam, the Olam, that the, the God is the Adon, the master of? If you look at English translation, some of them will say the master of the universe, the master of the world, Olam, we talk about the world. And um, some will say the master of eternity, right? We, we say in Kaddish, Le Olam or Me Olam, right? Le Olam Vaid. Is, is Le Olam uh, um, the universe in, in space or the universe in time? Is it eternity? What exactly is the translation of the Olam? What's the etymology of the word Le Olam? Right? So the, these aren't, these aren't uh, clear questions. Le Olam, it may be linked to the words um, Ile, which means that which is hidden. Because uh, the, 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 the eternity and the universe is somehow hidden from us. So, so maybe Chazal was saying, in Shal Mikra, in simple reading, one should understand that that Va'avod um, Olam means till the Oval. The, the, the world operates in eras in 50 year slots, and each sort of passage or each era of time is referred to as Olam, as a. As a uh, um, as a as a, a, a unit, we, we use this, by the way, in in um, in, uh, in 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 modern Hebrew and even some rabbinic Hebrew and so on. You know, maybe we'll talk about the Olam HaTorah, the world of Torah. We don't mean that's the whole universe. It's it's like it's a space, right? It's about people's inner world, right? In English, we use that, and there's the equivalent in the Balei Musa talk about the Olam Apnimi, the inner world that people have. So Olam can mean a uh, rather than it being the whole of eternity, it can be a a particular zone, a particular space. And therefore, maybe when it says Vavodu Olam, it means for the next era. How long is an era? Maybe eras, in, in, you know, we think of in, in, in the second world living centuries, right? Things defined in century terms. Maybe in, in, in sort of mashava terms and, and Jewish philosophical terms, the Olam is an era. Eras are split up into chunks of Yovel size bit. And when the Pasuk says that Vavodu Olam, it means for this era, in other words, the next period of time till the next Yovel. So that's well, that's one way of resolving this sort of measures with Peshat, that the Peshat of the Pasuk is, is till the Yovel. That's, that's one way of conceptualizing it. Um, the Mesha Chachma, in a very beautiful piece, addresses uh, um, this topic. 
And he says that, again, we have an example of where Pshutoi Shal Mikra, the simple read in the Pasuk, and the Medrash are teaching us different layers of meaning in a very important way. And the Meshach Chachmah says that fundamentally, the servitude of the Evadivri, who has the Ibs board, is an eternal servitude. The Yovel is a disruption to that eternal servant servitude. In other words, it's not that when the Eved sells, agrees to remain a slave forever, the explanation is this is a contract for the next 15 years, 20 years, 27 years, 50 years, till the next Yovel, but rather he's signing up for eternity. However, a Yovel that occurs ruptures, breaks, snaps the bond between the Eved and their master, thus releasing them. Karosem the robe or it. A yovid is a cry of freedom. And therefore, at that point, the person leaves the, um, their bondage, leaves their slavery and goes free. What would happen were yovel to be cancelled? Then the person would say, a slave forever. And we have such a scenario. At the time of the, at the, time of the exile of the ten tribes, so quick reminder of uh, Jewish history, in the generation after Shlomo HaMelech, the Jewish people sadly split into two uh, there's a civil war, the Jewish people slip into two nations, we call them Yehuda and Yisrael, ten tribes uh, break away from the Davidic dynasty, from the descendants of uh, of David and Shloma, from the son of them, of Rehovam, and they break away under the leadership of Yerovam, who appoints himself a king, and we now have two Jewish kingdoms, some 200 years after that, some 200 years before the Chorban by Sirishan, for the destruction of the first temple, the Yisrael kingdom is destroyed by Sancherev, and only the Rump kingdom of Yehuda is left, you no longer have kol yeshveha oleha. You no longer have the majority of the Jewish people living in uh, the lands of Israel. And many halachas are dependent upon the majority of Jews living in the lands of uh, Israel. And amongst other things, Yovel practice ceases. It's, they cease when the 10 tribes go into exile. So what happens if you have the misfortune to be an Eved Ivri, um, who has one's ears has their ears pierced and sells themselves into, agrees to Avodol Olam, to the status of being a servant forever, and Yovel is now cancelled. So Yovel comes round, and the Evadivri is fed up with, uh, um, with being in slavery, or perhaps the master is fed up of having the Evadivri. We know that uh, um, Chazal said, quote a, a, uh, a proverb that floated around the streets of Yerushalayim, back in the day, that uh, anyone who's Kona and Eved is Kona Rabbi, is Kona Master. The conditions of the treatment of the Eved Ivri were so um, elevated that owning an Eved Ivri was, was quite an expensive business. So uh, perhaps the Master wants to get rid of his slave, and he says, uh, um, you know, this year should have been a Yovel. Sadly, our sister kingdom has been destroyed by some Sancherev. There's no longer Kol there's no longer a Yovel, but um, I want you to go free. I only, when, when, I, when your ear got bored, I only signed up for, I want to go free, I only signed up for 12 years because I expected the next Yovel to come in 12 years' time, but there is no Yovel. Says the Meshach Achma, no, Avado Olam. the servitude is forever. Um, the Yovel uh, ruptures the servitude, it breaks the bond. It's, it's a, 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 an external freeing of the Evet. No Yovel, no external freeing happening, therefore you stay in slavery forever. So, so the, the genius of this piece of uh, Meshach Hochman, a very, very beautiful piece, is that um, he is, he's, he's arguing that both the Pshat and the Medrash are telling us halachic truths. The Pshat is telling us um, that the servitude is forever. The Pasuk in Vayikra, in Sefer Vayikra, as understood by Chazal, is telling us that Yovel frees. And there's no contradiction between the two. There's conceptual layers as to how the halacha works. So this is uh, another example of this uh, of this principle. Um, I'm going to try to try and use the time available to share a couple of the other examples. Um, the next example is is one actually I I, uh, I have not thought of in the context of this year. Um, many people, when I began this series, pointed out to me that Rabbi Emmanuel Bernstein had published a sefer called Social Mikra, in which he looks extensively at the topic um, based on the writings of Rav Cooperman, his Rebbe Rav Cooperman, and. Um, I, I, after I prepared the show, I had to look at, someone gave me, gifted me the two volumes of his work, and I think he's also emailing them uh, as emails, very beautiful Torah, and uh, well, I hadn't messed up too badly, uh, I think most of what I'm saying uh, um, is, is lined up with what he says, and uh, that's a few little ideas, but um, he, he brings an example, which which I, I hadn't thought of using, but I think, again, is a, a very, very interesting halachic one, um, and I, I don't want to go too much into detail of it, but um, it, it, uh, I'll give another example of, of where Pshat and Medrash, again, 
um, seem to offer an alignment which enriches our halachic understanding. Um, anyone who listens to laning around the season of the Yomim Tovim, particularly around Pesach, um, notes that there is a parallel between the language used for Sukkot and the language used for Pesach, in which both appear to be seven-day festivals, um, and both of them seem to have their relevant mitzvahs for seven days. For Sukkot Teshu Shivas Yomim, you should live in the Sukkot for seven days, and Shivas Yomim Matzos Tochelu, one should eat matzah for, uh, for seven days. Nonetheless, in practical halacha, this isn't the way it works. The mitzvah to eat matzah is only the first, or in chutzah, it's the second also, the first night of Pesach. There's a mitzvah to eat a kazayis of matzah, to have an achila, minimal eating of matzah, one kazayis of matzah on the first night of Pesach. And also, if you choose to eat potatoes, or if you're lucky enough to be svadi rice, over the rest of Pesach, that's it. You don't have to eat uh, matzah. Now, it is true that over Pesach will fall a Shabbos and a Yom Tov, and there's a mitzvah to eat bread on Shabbos and Yom Tov, and the only bread you can eat is matzah. But that's not because fundamentally there's a mitzvah to eat matzah over seven days of Pesach. There is a prohibition to eat chomet, and therefore on, on days when there's a mitzvah to have a soda, I may end up having to eat, uh, to eat matzah. But fundamentally, the mitzvah of eating matzah is a one-night mitzvah. And Chazal understand this, again, midrashically, based on uh, a stira, a contradiction, in the, uh, in the Pesachim, in which they understand there's only an obligation, a chiv, a chiva, to eat matzah on the first night of Pesach, and that's it. And therefore they understand when the Pesach says, Shivas yomim tochli matzah, so you should eat matzah for seven days. What he really means is, if you, if you wish to have bread, have matzah, don't eat chametz. But there's not a positive mitzvah to eat, uh, to eat uh, matzah. Now, normative halacha is that there's no particular reason to eat matzah the whole of Pesach. No reason to eat matzah. If you, you can choose to have a meal of potatoes, as I said. And other than the first night of Pesach, no mitzvah whatsoever. The Vilna Gaon, um, who obviously, due to stature, has, has a great deal of halachic weight, um, says uh, a chiddush, an innovation, which has some precedence in earlier sources also. But the Vilna Gaon is, is, is the most famed presenter of this halachic position, in which he says, no, there's an obligation, a chiv, to eat matzah the first night of Pesach, but there is a mitzvah kiyumis, a, in a moment I'll define it better, but I'm going to call it a voluntary mitzvah, to eat matzah the whole of Pesach. Now, the concept of mitzvah kiyumis is not a simple concept at all. Mitzvah kiyumis is, is uh, a mitzvah that if you do, you have a kiyum, you have a fulfillment of the mitzvah, um, but there's no obligation. Um, and it's in a sense an oxymoron, it's sort of a contradiction in terms. If it's an instruction, a tzivoy, then it's not voluntary. And if it's voluntary, then it's not a tzivoy. Now, we often use the term mitzvah kiyumis to talk about something which is a circumstantial mitzvah. But once you have that circumstance, it's an absolute obligation. That's not what the Vilna Gaon means over here. So let me just explain what I mean. If you eat a bread meal, you have to bench on it. You have no obligation. You can get through life without ever saying Bechat HaMazim, without ever doing that mitzvah, if you wish, by never eating bread. You can get through life by never doing the mitzvah of mezuzah, by never living in a house, never owning and, and uh, renting a house, and never having a house with doorways, live in a tent your whole life. You'll never do the mitzvah of mezuzah. In that sense, they are also circumstantial mitzvahs, mitzvot kiyumiyot. If you eat a bread meal, you have to bench. If you have a house, you have to put up a mezuzah. But once you have a house, once you eat a bread meal, they are chiyot, they are an absolute obligation. They are a mitzvah, they are a commandment from God. The Vilna Gaon and, and, and others also argue that there is a category of mitzvah in which the Torah presents uh, spiritual practices which are, are good things to do. If you do it, you have a kiyom of a mitzvah, but no obligation to so do. And one example of this is eating matzah the rest of Pesach. There's no obligation to eat matzah the rest of Pesach, but if you do so, you have a kiyom of mitzvah, you're fulfilled a mitzvah. A different translation of the word mitzvah, what the word mitzvah means exactly, it's not an instruction in, in the normal sense of the words, it's, it's more relationship -able. It's it's a relationship, right? Relationships have aspects which are oblig obligatory, and relationships have aspects which are voluntary, and, and our relationship with Hashem has those two halachic categories also. There are those who suggest that the etymology of the word mitzvah comes and civil, it's, it's actually not a clear word grammatically what it, what it means in Tzadi. There are those who suggest it comes from the word Tzavtza or Tsevet. In modern Hebrew, Tsevet is a team. In classical, in, in Aramaic, Tzavtza is a, also a team, a, a, a unit. Um, a Tsevet means a connection. So there are those who suggest that Tzivoy should be translated as something like a relationship or opportunity. 
Now, in the relationship, there are relationship aspects of mitzvahs, which are instructions, but there's relationship aspects of mitzvahs, there's relationship building or not, obligations. And the literal translation of mitzvah may not be commandments, as we often translate it. It may be, um, I don't want to call it advice, because it sounds like all mitzvahs are voluntary, but uh, the Rambam, by the way, in the, no less than the Rambam, in Mishnah Torah, not in his Moen Avuchim, calls mitzvahs eitzahs. Calls them as vice, by the way. He, don't, he doesn't mean or counsel. He doesn't mean they're advice in the sense that they're optional. But he means they are they are they are routes to achieving a a goal beyond the mitzvah itself. The Zohar also, by the way, calls mitzvahs atzim eight the same same uh, same idea. So um, I'll take a second. So so in this understanding of the the halachic innovation of the Vilna Gaon, there is a, another category of mitzvah, maybe mitzvah not meaning commandment by relationship moving, maybe not, um, of a mitzvah kiyumis. And therefore the Vilna Gaon, and this is the reason I mention this here is because it's another example of it. And as I said, others say it well before the Vilna Gaon, but the Vilna Gaon was the one that pushed this halachic position. It says, mm-hmm. you should eat matzahs for seven days, even in the Midrashic reading, isn't taken away from its Peshat. Eat matzahs for seven days is a good thing to do. Obligation to eat matzahs, the Midrash reveals to us is only a one-day uh, mitzvah. Sorry, Andrew. I think I see the word prescription. Prescription. Prescription, maybe. This is prescription. Prescription also prescribed. I, I, don't, I don't know. Oh, you mean like, uh, it's prescribed as in uh, prescribed, a prescription, right? My doctor's not telling you to do it there. there. Rec- recommendate it's more than recommendation that the, the the because you do have to do it most mitzvahs are mitzvah here obviously they're, obli- they're, they're obligatory prescription and voluntary prescription yeah okay I, i've struggled always to work out exactly how to translate it in uh in in uh, sort of english um but either way for the purposes of our our discussion um this is a, another beautiful example of where both the shot and the medrash have uh um have have uh have meaning um we're running out of time, so I'll just try and, and say two more examples, and then we'll we'll move from we we'll become very detail focused in the share, and then we'll try and next week step back and look at bigger picture matters again. Um, and I'll use two stories of um, uh, two stories in the Torah, um, where again there's a, there's a layers of meaning in the in the pshat and the drush. And one of these stories I've spoken about uh, in public before in in uh, in my drusha format. Um, so I'll just briefly mention it. Um, in the story of Yisro approaching Moshe, coming to visit Moshe, followed by Matan Torah, followed by the giving of the Torah, the one Midrashic opinion is that Yisro really turns up long after Matan Torah. And for some reason, the Torah put the story of Yisro before the giving of the Torah. Now, this brings us to a, a Midrashic concept, which Rashi cites, of a muktam um ucha batura. The, the Torah shouldn't only be read temporally, sequence. Now, again, we have really the same question. Is this idea that the Torah isn't read temporally, the stories don't have to be read in order, in, in chrono- chronological order, is this a Midrashic reading, but in Peshat, we should read the Torah in chronological order? Or, um, no, the, it, what Rashi is telling us is, this in Peshat, this isn't the sort of book that needs to be understood as chronological. If you understood what the book is, you'd realize it doesn't always bring an episode chronologically. By the way, this isn't a weird and wonderful idea. In, in modern literature, we have this, right? You have flashbacks, you have um, an author who, who you're telling you a story, and then they go back a thousand years to give you some context. We're used to the idea that even in, in um, again, I'm not comparing the literature. I'm, I'm simply saying that, that it could be a shut reading of the Torah, that you shouldn't read it chronologically. And by the way, the extent to which Russia uses the principle, and others use the principle of Eid Muqtum is is often underestimated. Um, the stories, the very opening stories of the life of Avram, when did he go to Orkastim, when did he leave and go to Choron, when did the Brisbane of Sorim occur, when did he, was he instructed to go to Eretz Israel, how did he go to Eretz Israel? If you learn Rashi to Seder in order, it turns out that he went to Israel. the Brisbane of Islam took place before Lech Lecha, it happened when he was 70, and it was only when he was 75 he went to Israel. It's remarkable how, how, how Rashi sometimes is willing to turn a narrative on its, on its head based on the principle of Ein Muktam and Mokhba Torah, understanding that the Torah story should be read uh, um, maybe conceptually rather than chronologically. Very interesting way of reading the text. Rashi, again, I remind you, says that when I'm choosing Midrashim, I'm always choosing the ones which align best with Shuta Shemikra. Rashi doesn't think there's a contradiction between Medrash and Shah. Rashi thinks that 
the the ASEC of Peshat, the endeavor of learning Peshat, is choosing Medrashim, which best align with, with the, the uh, Yashiv, uh, 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 allows a smooth reading of the Pesukim. But we shouldn't view Medrash as a contrasting approach to Peshat. That's Rashi's uh, view. Rashbam and Ibn Ezra disagree, but this is the view of Rashi. So Rashi sees Muktam as a perfectly reasonable tool to use within Peshutoy Shalmikra. Others disagree. No, the Peshat is the chart, the chronological order. And the Medrash turns the, the order on its uh, order on its uh, order on its head. We will see, by the way, next week. And 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 this Rashi is so little known, even though it's I didn't make it up. It's printed there in, in Rashi. Rashi says a muktam muchabatur about the seven days of creation. An amazing Rashi. And when we look next week at um, at looking at uh, um, at, at the the stories of Rashi's and and. Uh, how to how, you, you, some of the questions around around uh, how, how, uh, scientific relationships to these stories? We, we will see Rashi. Um, maybe I'll print it just so that people believe me. And we've got Hamashim here. Um, in Rashi says Ein Muktam Ochabatora right at the beginning of Sefer Gracious, an amazing thing when he's talking about the, the seven days of creation. Um, either way, in the Yisro story, uh, I'll just use this as an example. Uh, Rashi says Ein, Rashi brings the view of Ein Muktam Ochabatora, in which case the Torah positions. The Yisro story before Matan Torah, even though it happens, perhaps according to one opinion of the Tanoim, Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Shimon, or Machlokas, even though it happens afterwards, very, very interesting. So again, it, it just I'm just throwing this out in the world of story, the same question: When did Yisro come? We don't know really. Did he come earlier, and that's Pshutah Shemikra, and somehow the Medrash wants to say something else or not? Why does the Torah position the story of Yisro before uh, the giving of the Torah? So the Mefarshim gives different suggestions, either because it's a story of conversion of Gerus, and Yisro is a microcosm. Of one individual entering under the 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 kampi, kampi and the matan torah is an example of a national conversion, the whole nation entering into Gaius. Um, perhaps it's about leadership and the modesty and honor of of uh, of uh, Moshe. Um, perhaps it's about, as the Sefer Chinuch says, Kabbalistic reasons, Sirufi Osius. The, the Chinuch um, brings an idea which comes from Kabbalah, which is expressed by. The Ramban, that, and, and really we've been talking about it in a way. The whole Torah, we've been talking about Pshat and Drush, but there's also Remez and Soyd, the secrets of the Torah. The Ramban says the whole Torah is, is the Shemus of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and somehow in aligning the spiritual forces of, of creation, there's a need for this story to come ahead of Matan Torah. Um, or maybe this is the best preparation for Matan Torah, and it's telling us about what Torah is. We, we have a phrase, which I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail now, Derech Eretz Kodman Torah, that, that that one needs to be a functioning person who then receives Torah. A, a, uh, a, the, the people who stood at the foot of Har Sinai and were able to hear the words of Hashem and receive the Torah couldn't, couldn't be animalistic. They couldn't be animals. They had to be functioning humans who, 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 um, who, who had uh, dignity and to a degree and morality and, and functionality, and they could receive the Torah. And maybe the Torah deliberately tells us a story of a Yisra. It's, it's an amazing story. If you think about it, a setup of a story and it wants to tell us what it means to be a receiver of the Torah, it takes a story of the, the prime example of Jewish leadership, the greatest Jewish leader ever, the greatest teacher of Torah ever, Moshe, and a figure who is set up as the most significant outsider imaginable, a Yisro who isn't even a Jew, hasn't even been part of the Yisro Mitzrayim, and Yisro steps forward and he says to Moshe, how you are running the, the camp is wrong, how you are running the Jewish people is wrong, and Moshe takes this this message from a, 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 a person very far from the heart of the Jewish people and, and adapts his leadership based on that. So, so maybe this is a message of, you're about to receive the Torah, and Hashem says, I want you to know what sort of person can receive Torah and what, what the parameters of Torah are. Don't think just because you're Moshe Rabbeinu, the teacher of Torah, that when it comes to, that, that you shouldn't be able to hear the words of a Yisro, the, most, the, the furthest removed communicate to someone who's within the world of Maccabi Torah, but as far removed from that as possible, and the message that's given. So so again, in, in each, uh, e even in stories of the Torah, the, the, the strata and layers of meaning between Pshat and, and Medrash seem, seem to be um, significant. Um, one final example of this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause for today, is, um, is the very difficult episode around the, or very difficult sequence of Tukim around the length of the exile in Egypt. So again, um, if anyone's tried to work through um, the Psukim, um, there are there are layers of complication as to the dating and length of the exile in Egypt, both when it is predicted um, in the Brisbane of Osorium, uh, and and when they actually go down to Egypt. 210 years, 400 years, 430 years. Is it dated from 
the giving of, is it dated from the descent to Egypt or from the birth of Yitzchok or from the Brisbane Abbasarim? These are all, all uh, very unclear. By the way, this is one of Rashi's sources that um, Brisbane Abbasarim happens before Lech Lecha because if 430 years is from the Brisbane Abbasarim and 400 years is from the birth of Yitzchok, Yitzchok was born when Avram was 100, in which case uh, the Brisbane Abbasarim must have taken place 30 years before the Brisbane Abbasarim, uh, 30 years before the birth of Yitzchok, in which case he was only 70. But when he was 70, he hasn't yet been instructed Lech Lecha, and therefore, it must be Lachna Shot took place after the Brisbane Abzor. Either way, very complex uh, dating challenges. So, again, there are those who suggest that these dates are left deliberately ambiguous because there's flexibility built into how the system should work. And this ties up with the Medrashim that Hakon um, uh, that perhaps they should have left Egypt later, but they weren't able to be sustained. And others may be built into the system as a certain flexibility as to how it should be understood. Um, in order to allow different models of exile to occur, in order to allow uh, um, um, different lengths of exile, depending on how the Jewish people responded, how the Egyptians behaved, and how they were able to cope with the amount of time. In other words, sometimes people can choose deliberate, creative ambiguity in order to leave room for multiple interpretations, because multiple interpretations are unnecessary and important in our, uh, in our relationship with, um, with, uh, with people. Um, I'll, I'll finish actually just with a story about the Mesha Um I, I, I was privileged to know a, a when, when I first came to Israel, a very elderly um, gentleman who, who still had lived in, in pre-war Europe and um, learnt in, uh, in the great Lithuanian yeshivas. And um, he mentioned that um, there had been a, they had been learning a piece of Ur Sameach. Ur Sameach is the Mesha Chochma's halachic works. The Mesha Chochma wrote um, a, a, a commentary on the Torah, which is a beautiful combination. I love the Meshach Rachman, I often cite him. It's a combination of Pshat and Medrash and Halacha and philosophy and Kabbalah. Uh, to my mind, the Meshach Rachman is the last figure that spans every genre of, of Torah. I mean, he was a, a, a Halachist of the first tier. He was a London and, and a, a Falpel of the first tier. Um, he was a, a, a Kabbalist, a philosopher, a Baal Pshat, a Baal Medrash, a very, very beautiful saver. So he wrote a, a, a Londish work, a work on the Rambam in this sort of more style of the world of yeshivas called the Osameach. And um, this, the, the, this, uh, this elderly gentleman who told me a story that occurred when he was learning in Lithuanian in, in the Mir. And he said two of his friends had a debate about the meaning of a particular passage in the Osameach and what the concept that the Osameach was trying to share was. And they decided to travel up to Dvinsk to speak to the Osameach about it. Um, Dvinsk was, was a little bit out of the centre of Lithuanian Jewry. It was it's further north, and it wasn't really in the, in the area of... The Osmech was a little bit cut off from sort of the heartlands of, of the world of yeshivas. And when they took a train and travelled up, uh, they were to speak to him, and they told him that they, they felt that what he had written there was ambiguous and the concept could be understood to you the way. And the Osmech replied, saying, um, the truth is, I, I, when I said this concept, I, in my own mind, was thought it could be conceived of either way and in fact i had a third way of conceptualizing it, which she shared with them and i deliberately crafted my language so that it could be understood in 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 uh, in, mul in multiple ways so it was open to interpretation now i share that because it's, it's a wonderful story about uh, how those smear wrote but the truth is i think in some ways we're all familiar with this right we we all in in different realms and different spheres sometimes use creative ambiguity because we ourselves are unsure or, or we're confident and happy to be understood in different ways and, and want to do so and uh, um, the Osmech argues this about the Torah, in which he, he says that the Torah itself can be understood. The Meshach argues about the Torah itself. He said there are times in which Hashem chose creative ambiguity because there were multiple ways in which the story could play out and he wanted to leave the, the story uh, open. And this is another area in which Medrash can interact with Bashat. Medrash can open up alternative readings which, which allow us to explore possibilities of how things can, uh, can go. So uh, with this, I'll conclude sort of the nitty gritty part of looking at the relationship with the Medrash and Shat. And please, well, next week, we'll, we'll try and look at this uh, step back to sort of a bit bigger picture um, about, about where, where, where we can go with, with all of this. Um, that's, uh, that's for today. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank, you, very you. Much. thank you, David. When are you back, David? Uh, Tuesday, I'm coming back. Uh, oh, so 